to worship on this Sunday, the second Sunday of Advent, as we go through our Advent journey beginning to, uh, leading up to Christmas. A uh, special welcome to all those who are joining us online this morning. Pray that uh, all of us be richly blessed as we share in the word this morning. Liam is going to come forward and help me as we uh, light the candles of the Advent wreath this morning. Last Sunday, we lit the first candle in our Advent wreath, the candle of hope. We light it again as we remember that Christ, who was born in Bethlehem, will come again to fulfill all of God's promises to us. So Liam, if you would like to light the candle of hope from last week. And the second candle of Advent is the candle of peace. Peace is the word that we hear a lot. It is one of the things that we hope for. Christ brought peace when he came, first came to us, and he will bring everlasting peace when he comes again. If you would say with me, the prophet Isaiah called Christ the Prince of Peace. When Jesus came, he taught people the importance of being peacemakers. He said that those who make peace shall be called the children of God. So we now light the candle of peace to remind us that Jesus is the Prince of Peace and that through him peace is found. Peace is like a light shining in a dark place. As we look at this candle, we celebrate the peace we find in Jesus Christ. So let's say together, thank you, God, for the peace you give us. We ask that as we wait for all your promises to come true and for Christ to come again, that you would remain present with us. Help us today and every day to worship you, to hear your word, and to do your will by sharing your peace with each other. We ask it in the name of the one who was born in Bethlehem. Amen. So we're now going to enter into our time of praise and worship. Let's stand as we begin with the carol, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear.
cuts out in the next one, keep singing. It's just fading away. I think it's about to have a burial.
You may be seated. Just before we go into kids, you can just stay where you are for the moment, please. Well, you can sit down there, Ben. It's all right. Um, we sang it as well with my soul before. And in this last week, we've had um, two lots of people of our church have lost their loved ones. Norman West has lost uh, Norm's uh, mum has passed away. And also Aileen, uh, her husband Ted, has passed away. So I'd just like to um, extend to both of you our um, love and prayers as your church family. And just like to pray for you at this time as uh, coming to church after a loved one has died is not easy. So let's pray. Gracious Lord, we come before you to thank you that uh, as we celebrate this uh, Christmas time, that there are those for whom the celebration is a little bit saddened because of the passing of their loved ones. Lord, we pray for Norm and Wendy and Norm's siblings and all the family at this time. And we pray for Aileen and uh, all of her family and Ted's family at this time. But Jesus, today we hear the words of the prophet Isaiah, comfort, comfort. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would just minister comfort into their hearts uh, to give them peace, uh, to give them a real inner quiet, Lord, that they may face the, the week ahead with confidence and with faith and with trust uh, because of the fact that you came as a baby in the manger you died upon the cross for us and rose again so that we may have life eternal. So we thank you, Lord, for these precious folk who are now resting in your everlasting arms. And we thank you, Lord, that they have received the reward of a life filled with faith. And we pray that you would bless them as they find their place in heaven and bless their loved ones who mourn particularly Norm and Wendy and the family, and Aileen and the family. In your precious name we pray, O oh Lord. Indeed, it is well, because you are the God of life. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone, and blessings to you. So the kids are all here, so we just need the kids' talker. So here she comes. Well, I certainly know how to talk. Yeah, I know you know that. Good morning. Hi. And I know that you know the you. Okay, all right. We'll leave it at that. Hey, we're a week closer to Christmas. Are you excited? No? Oh. Are you guys excited? Yes? Yes? Is there all sorts of stuff happening? Is anybody still going to school or have you finished for the year? I wish I was. I wish I was. On Tuesday. I Tuesday it finishes. You next week. Okay. So some people have finished. Hands up those who wish that we were finished for the year as well. Yes, there's a few of us that would like to be finished for the year. Okay. So last week we had the candle of hope. What candle was it today? Indy, peace. It was peace. Now, Indy, what is peace? What does it mean? Peace. Hang on, wait, wait. I asked Indy. I'll come back to you, Ben. Do you know? It's a hard word. Ben, tell me. It's a piece of something. A piece of something. No, it's spelt a bit differently. It's not that piece. Um, calm. 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 That's a really good word for peace. I like that word, Harriet. Calm. Okay. Peace and love. Okay, so love and peace kind of go together, don't they? That's really good. You know, one of the great verses from the Bible that we hear at Christmas time is from Luke, and it says, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Well, you know, this time of the year really doesn't feel very peaceful. Have you been to the shops lately? No. Is it peaceful at the shops? No. Have you been in the car and gone somewhere lately? Is it peaceful on the road? No. 
No. Are mum and dad getting a bit stressed at home? Is it peaceful at home? <gasps> yeah. I can tell you one home that's quite stressful at the moment leading up to Christmas. Okay. So sometimes Christmas is more busy and rushed and stressful than it is peaceful. But, you know, we're actually talking about a different kind of peace. We're talking about the peace that came to earth when Jesus was born. And that's a piece that kind of lives in here, really. It's a puzzle piece. Well, not quite like a puzzle piece, but it is certainly part of the Christmas puzzle. Jesse, I like that. That's great. Actually, we make a puzzle when God sent Jesus at Christmas time, no matter no matter what our Jesse, no matter what our lives feel like at Christmas. Jesus' peace means that he is still in control. No matter how busy we are, he is in control. And inside we know that he is there and he's taking hold of what happens in our lives. I'm just going to grab that candle. Let's see if I can keep it alight. So what candle was this one? What candle was it? Peace. I'm going to pop it in here. So I want you, when you think of the word peace, I want to make a bit of a picture for you, and I want you to remember this, when you think about Jesus as the peace in our lives. So I want this to be Jesus, the peace in our lives, okay? When things happen that make life not quite so peaceful, like an argument with mum and dad, put that in there. Do you ever argue with your mum, Harriet? Yeah? Indy, do you argue with your mum and dad? Oh, yeah. I used to. Well, I still do with my dad. When you forget to do your homework, that's a bit stressful. <gasps> when you don't understand the maths that was in class, that's a bit stressful. When you've got a test coming up at school, Harriet, it's a bit stressful. When you've got troubles with friends, it's a bit stressful. When it's too hot, that gets really stressful. I get really stressful about that. Jesse? When you break up with your girlfriend. Oh, Jesse's broken up with his girlfriend. Have you broken up with your girlfriend? No, okay. That is really, I'm going to put lots of water in for that one. That's a really stressful one. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and she's in grade three and I'm only in grade one. Okay, so let's sit down again, Jesse, and listen. This is great. This is going really well, guys. <laughs> so now let's bring it back. Have a look at what's happened here. So I have got this candle in the middle, and it is completely surrounded by our worries. That water represents our worries. It's completely surrounded. But, you know, Jesus is always bigger than the number of worries that we surround him with. So when you take your worries to Jesus and surround him with them, it helps us to remember that we are not in control, that he is, and that's amazing. Let's pray. No. We're going to pray now, Jesse. Dear God, we just thank you for sending Jesus to bring us peace. Sometimes it doesn't feel very peaceful, but we know that you are the peace in our hearts and we know that we can bring anything to you that is worrying us and surround you with it. You will never drown in it. You will always take control. We need to trust and love you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thanks, guys. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Clenda. Um, you could have come with me to Toastmasters on Tuesday night. We had a special speech about um, talking to an unruly audience. Okay, let's stand and share the peace. So the Lord be with you. We are the body of Christ. And the peace of the Lord be always with you. 
So let's share the peace with each other as we wave the kids off to Kids Club. Okay, Gary's going to come forward now and read the gospel for us. So if you would remain standing, please. The gospel reading is from Mark chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. Those of you who'd like to follow in, follow in on the uh, Pew Bibles, you'll find it on page 990. So it's Mark 1, verses 1 to 8. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptised by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. You may be seated. And I'd like to speak to you this morning from the Old Testament reading for today, which is from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 to 11. And if you too would like to follow in your pew Bible, it's on page 714. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all humankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out, and I said, what shall I cry out? All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because of the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up to a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout, lift it up, do not be afraid, and say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. <clears throat> he gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Let's bow our heads in prayer. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, as we hear again the Advent cry, let us hear your voice to comfort, bless, and prepare us and empower us for your second coming. In your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> now, last week I spoke to you from Isaiah 64, verses 1 to 9, and I called my sermon, The Cry of God's People. The voice that we heard in those verses was the voice of Isaiah the prophet as he was crying out to God on behalf of God's people. It was a time in Israel's history when she had just returned home from being in exile for 70 years in Babylon for her sins against God. 
Isaiah had begun his prophecy with the cry, rend the heavens and come down. And as we continued to explore that text, we discovered that indeed he did in the person of Jesus Christ. And in Jesus Christ, God came to remould and remake us just as a potter remakes and remoulds broken clay into something beautiful, something good. Now, in today's reading from Isaiah, we're not going to hear from Isaiah, actually. Rather, we're going to hear from four unidentified voices in heaven. Now, the time in Israel's history into which these voices speak is actually the time towards the end of their exile in Babylon. It's the voices from heaven that are to declare to them that it is time to get ready to go home. And as such, these voices from the courts of heaven combine to bring comfort to God's people who are in exile in Babylon. Without identifying the voices, Isaiah heard these heralds of heaven speak the word of God, which would become his message. And although the content of these four messages are different, the tone is still the same. Rather than speaking out judgment to his rebellious children, through these four voices, God speaks words of comfort to his children in exile, wounded by their sin. We hear the first voice in verses 1 and 2. Comfort, comfort my, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now, this voice is the voice of grace. This grace comes from the very heart of God, that as he looks out upon his people, he not only cries once, but twice, comfort, comfort my people. The double use of the word comfort reinforces the depth of feeling that God has for his people. They will not only be comforted now, but in the future when they will be restored. God has not abandoned his people as they thought. The covenant of grace and love that he made with Abraham and continued through David is still in force. Out of that grace and love, the voice of heaven tells Isaiah to speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Speak from his heart to their hearts. Her hard service has been completed. Her sin has been paid for. She has received from the Lord's hand double for all her, her sin. Hard service refers to the hardships of the exile, what it was like living in a foreign land under subjection and longing for home. It's now finished. They'll be able to return home. Her sin has been paid for. Now, the Hebrew word for sin here means not only just the action of sin, but also the action and the punishment for the sin that goes along with it. Paid for doesn't mean that Israel simply paid a debt and deserves release, because release after serving a sentence normally means parole or probation, and then the record remains. But this is full freedom. Pardon is given and the record is erased. The groundwork of forgiveness is laid here. Double for all her sins does not mean that God's chastening is unfair, but rather that he has chastened his people in an equivalent manner to what they had done. Their time of discomfort was over. The voice of grace has spoken. Now, this Advent, the voice of grace still speaks into our lives to give us comfort in our discomfort. Now, there's a sense in which we, like the Israelites, are in captive slavery, living in exile in a world that is not our home. But because Israel find themselves in Babylon as a result of their sin against God, we should not be so quick to judge them. For it is possible that the discomfort we feel in life as God's people 
is also as a result of our rebellion against God. Isaiah says in chapter 57, 20 and 21, But the wicked are like the tossing sea which cannot rest, whose waves cast up more and more mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Now, when we read the word wicked in our Bibles, we often associate it with a lifestyle that is different from our own. We think of gross evil, of pedophiles, of drug pushers, of mafia members. We think that it probably doesn't apply to us. But you see, gross evil, wickedness, is a product of our prior choices, choices to live life without God as he is revealed in Scripture. And believers can be guilty of this in a number of ways. In the Old Testament, the word wicked refers to those who have no relationship with God by faith in his promises. It refers to people who live by their passions, their desires, thinking that this is the way to peace and security and satisfaction. We would call them ungodly because they're trying to find happiness in life apart from their relationship with God. But in Isaiah chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, this word is used of God's own covenant people who, thinking like the nations, had ignored their relationship with God and his word. God's people were attempting to live life without fellowship and trust in him through the cleansing power of his word, which also pointed to a Messiah who would shed his blood as a substitute for our sin in Isaiah 53. We need to remember the very first sin of Adam and Eve was to live life independently from God. This is the greatest form of wickedness, and it's easy to do. It's often called disobedience, and it separates us from God. And as such, as Christians, our lives are to be lived in close relationship with God and careful application of his word to the whole of our lives. But living in the world that we do, it is easy to drift it is easy in our discomfort to go looking for comfort in things other than God and his will and ways. It's easy to find our comfort in things uh, that God has not decreed, that God has not ordained. The good news of Advent is that God calls to all people in their sin. He calls to them in the word of grace. It's time to come home. God's arms are always open. He's always ready to receive us. The second voice in Christ from heaven, a voice of one calling, in the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places are plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now this voice is the voice of providence. Between where the Israelites were in Babylon and where they longed to be in Jerusalem was, a hundred, was an 870 kilometre trek, much of it through desert land. It looked hard and difficult and fraught with danger. Now, I want to tell you about a story many years ago when I was in the Navy Reserve at HMAS Morton. I uh, went on a number of ships, and at, a at times we would have on those ships what's called Admiral's Divisions. Now, either a Rear Admiral or a Full Admiral would visit the ship. What the ship's captain would do would be to prepare a route through the ship that the admiral would be taken through for his inspection. And so we as sailors used to paint and polish, rub and scrub and tidy to perfection everywhere where the admiral would walk and everywhere everything that he would see. The rest of the ship could be a bit of a mess but where the admiral walked, it was perfect as could be. So in our text, using that analogy, 
Israel, the Israelites are the admiral and God is the sailor, preparing the way, removing the obstacles, straightening the crooked paths and smoothing out the hills and valleys. It's an unmistakable evidence of grace. God is going before his people and preparing the way for their redemption. And wherever and wherever the transcendent God touches down in human history, his glory, as we see in verse 5, is revealed and all humankind will see it together. John the Baptist was the fulfillment of this voice and Jesus was the fulfillment of this verse. All humankind saw God's glory when Jesus was born. So what is the good news for the Old Testament people of God? And what is the good news for us as the New Testament people of God, both in exile because of our sin? It is that no obstacle will prevent God from coming in forgiveness and deliverance for his people. God provides the way out, and he has through his son who displayed his glory to all humanity. Nothing can stop God coming to you in grace, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The third voice then speaks, a voice says, cry out, and I said, what shall I cry? All people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. This voice is the voice of truth. All men are like grass. Assyria had taken the northern kingdom of Israel into captivity, and now they are gone. Babylon had taken the southern kingdom of Judah into captivity, and now they are gone. Persia has overthrown them, and the Israelites are on the way home. Like the grass, the nations and their leaders fulfill their purposes, and, and then they fade away. All of the powerful governments, leaders, nations, and organizations have not the ultimate power, and they do fade away. Their power and control are fleeting. All their glory is like the flowers of the field. When referring to secular leadership, glory means their power, influence, and control. When referring to people who are like grass, it refers to loyalty, affection, and faithfulness. We can seek comfort in people and power that is not of God, but ultimately they will fail us. And why is this? It is because we are all like grass, no matter who we are. But there is one who is full of power and control, and he is the one who controls our destiny, for he blows his breath on us and we fade away and perish. But he is Lord. And when all around us offers us false comfort, when we turn away from God and seek comfort elsewhere, there is only one place that we can find truth and comfort. And this is in the word of God, and it's an eternal word. It will not fail or forsake us or let us down. It is the one thing we can rely on. And it is the one thing that will give us true comfort in the face of all the maladies that we face living on this earth. This word of our God is not only God's proclamation to his people and what we know to be true in the Bible, it is also God's actions and activities in the world. That the word of our God stands forever is a strong affirmation of God's ultimate lordship over all human history. It is in him that we have our comfort and in him we have everlasting life. Nowhere else. The fourth voice is found in verses 9 to 11. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. 
Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lamb in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. This voice is the voice of love. Now the people of Judah and Jerusalem come out of the valley and climb the mountain top to declare the good news of God's victory over the enemy. The good news in that day was the defeat of Babylon and the release of the captives in exile so they could go home. The good news for us today is the defeat of sin, death and the devil by Jesus Christ and salvation to all who will trust in him. God's arm is a mighty arm for winning the battle. God's arm, uh, it, the, uh, Isaiah says, see, the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. But this mighty arm is also a loving arm for carrying his weary lambs. Listen again to what Isaiah said. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Last week we saw the Advent God come as a potter. This week we see the Advent God come as a shepherd. All sheep need the shepherd's strong arm for protection and the shepherd's open hand for their feeding. Lambs in particular need the shepherd's embrace for their security and pregnant ewes need the gentle guidance of the shepherd's staff to keep them from falling. God will be all of these things to the flock of Judah and will be all of these things to us, his flock today. We can trust him because he cares for us. He is our faithful shepherd. So the voices from heaven call to us today to tell us that salvation is coming. Our redemption is near. God cries out to us in our discomfort that we experience living in this broken, sin-stained world, and he promises us comfort. He is coming in ultimate forgiveness and deliverance. We can be sure of this because his word is eternal. We do not put our trust in anyone or anything else on this earth, for it is all fading away. God alone is to be trusted. He comes to us not only as a victor, but also as shepherd to feed, God, guide, guard, and love us. But it doesn't end there. As a result of his coming in the person of Jesus Christ, there is a fifth voice, a voice that has its roots in heaven, but it is spoken here. And it is our voice, yours and mine. The voice of God's people who are to proclaim to all people the comfort, the deliverance, the salvation and the love of God that we have experienced. Out in this world, there are many who are caught up in the sin, the discomfort, the fleetingness of this world and its false hopes and its promises. The call to us as God's people in this Advent season is to go forward as the herald of heaven to those who are hurting, those who are lost, those who are struggling those who are in pain and cry to them the good news from heaven, comfort, comfort. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have not only received your heaven, heavenly call of comfort and that you have made it reality through the birth, the uh, death, the rising again of your son, Jesus Christ, 
but also, Lord, that you call us as your Advent people to be your heralds in this broken and fallen and lost world and to shout to the world of the comfort that was brought to us at Christmas time, that had its um, fulfillment at Easter and then will have its final glory at your return. So, Lord, help us to not only reach out and receive from you the comfort, but to share with this broken world, this uncomfortable world, the comfort that only you can bring and you can promise a comfort that has no end. In your precious name and to your glory we pray. Amen. So let us stand for our affirmation of faith this morning. Faith is the confident assurance that what we hope for is going to happen. God gives his approval to people because of their faith. By faith, we can bring acceptable offerings to God, of which he will approve, showing that we are his righteous people. It is impossible to please God without faith. Therefore, since we are part of a community of faith, let us get rid of all that slows us down. <clears throat> and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. You may be seated for the prayers. <clears throat> let us pray. Gracious God, at this Advent time, we come to you affected by the brokenness, the fallenness of our own sin and of this sin-stained world. And we cry out to you, O God, to rend the heavens and come down asunder. And Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask you, Lord, indeed, to send your supernatural comfort upon us. Touch us by your word and Holy Spirit to indeed encourage us on our journey through life, to help us be victorious in our battle over sin, to help us, O oh God, to receive peace and blessing in the midst of our discomfort. Lord, let us hear your cry of comfort and receive the comfort that you have to give us through the word and through the sacraments. And Lord, in your mercy, Lord, we come before you today to pray for a world that is increasingly uncomfortable, a world, Lord, that is affected by the ravages of coronavirus, a world that the in whose economies of many nations is falling apart. The discomfort for whom many, many nations are feeling at leadership level as there are problem and strife amongst the political leaders. Lord, we cry out to you for mercy and for comfort for those who are struggling, leading, and guiding our struggling world. And Lord, in your mercy, do we ask you, Lord, to bless those who are suffering in our parish, those who are suffering from loss and grief, those who are suffering as a result of health issues. Uh, we uh, particularly pray at this time, O oh Lord, for uh, Francis Lawrence for Ailsa Taft, 
also for uh, Wendy and uh, Brian Rogers, and no doubt uh, for Terry Strath, uh, for Joe Caldwell, and for many others of our members who are struggling with health issues at the moment, Lord. Give them your comfort, and Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we call out to you to ask to empower us to indeed be your people of comfort in the world. Lord, that when we see people in our street, people in our neighbourhood, people at our sporting clubs and in at our work, Lord, that we will be brave enough to share the comfort that you have to give them. Lord, bless us and help us, and in your mercy, and these prayers we offer you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And so we farewell our online viewers by saying with them the grace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all forevermore. Amen. And we stand here at the church to uh, sing the song, All My Ways, after which we will farewell our online viewers.